So for the last number of years, I have been doing research on the Japanese metabolist architects, specifically examples of their, their built housing. Uh, the metabolists were a group of architects that started working about 50 years ago, and for a movement that has been, uh, from the beginning, uh, devoted to ideas of change over time, 50 years later seemed like a great time to see, well, what has actually changed with our architecture. So um, this here uh, is their symbol behind me, um, which is basically uh, two parents and their offspring, this kind of idea of generation and of addition and of, of change, of course. Um, which I think probably reminds you of another symbol, uh, which is really, I think, one that in its relationship gets to kind of main idea of metabolism, of really trying to create an architecture that's about recycling. What's the kind of aesthetic, uh, cultural, social kind of potential of an architecture that thematizes really an idea of, of recycling? So um, when I started to think about uh, this talk, um, really one of the things that struck me looking around at how Really, resiliency so frequently gets described is always being described as this kind of uh, as bouncing back. And so, you know, looking around, this is from Environmental Building News. You have Bloomberg talking about buildings need to bounce back quickly after a disaster. Uh, there's the Rockefeller Foundation talking about the need for uh, bouncing back to make a more resilient New York. Another example from New York World again, this pairing always of resiliency as some kind of bouncing back. So there's this, this metaphor that comes up again and again all the time in so much kind of popular journalism and writing books. Uh, and I think really most famously recently, of course, with Andrew Zolli's book that we just heard mentioned. And I think that Zolli's cover really is like, boom, this is this kind of operating material metaphor of resilience, bouncing back. You have a rubber ball. A rubber ball is something that gets deformed by a pressure. Pressure is released. It springs back into shape. So I think that that kind of definition of resilience as a kind of bouncing back is very important. Uh, but I'd like to talk today uh, about one of the projects that I've been researching, um, a project that maybe only an architect could love, um, that actually was an incredibly successful housing project in Tokyo that was built in 1958 uh, by the architect Kunio Meikawa uh, that I think is really about an idea of not just bouncing back, but also bouncing forward. So the Harumi Apartments um, is a building that really has, I think, many aspects that we kind of traditionally associate with uh, bouncing forward, or I'm sorry, uh, bouncing back in architecture. You can see that it's a single loaded corridor. You have natural ventilation in the building. You don't need electricity for that. You have uh, elevations with the natural light. It's a south-facing building. You also have, you can see here in the original floor diagram, this skip stop floor system, so that basically you have three layers of floor sharing a single corridor. So really trying to build up the kinds of communities that can happen in this, this high rise apartment building. And as I think we know, really the kind of relationships with your neighbors, hopefully you like your neighbors, is really an important part of, I think, sustainable and resilient, resilient design. So um, I think that that what you have with Harumi is really a very different kind of aesthetic that maybe has gotten forgotten um, when we think of Japanese contemporary architecture today. You know, this is uh, Toyo Ito Sendai MediaTek. And Sendai is a building, like a lot of Japanese projects recently, they're very much about transparency and thinness. And I think what's interesting about Harumi in its relationship to resilience is that it's really about this idea of a kind of fatness. So in some way, I'm going to be talking today about a kind of um, fat architecture, if you will, uh, that I think really has a lot to, to offer. Um, this is uh, Toshihiko Kumura, who is Harumi's engineer, who's kind of, for this long period in Japan, sort of the engineer of fatness, if you will. And what you see here is Tokyo in 1945. The city is over half destroyed uh, by Allied bombing. And I think what's important to realize is that this has happened really just almost 20 years after it was destroyed before, in 1923, in the Great Kanto earthquake. And in both of these cases, really what destroyed the fire, even though in one case it was started by an earthquake, was fire. You had a city that was incredibly flammable as well as prone to earthquakes. And that was really because the city was built primarily out of wood. So after the Second World War, uh, Japan had lost 4.2 million households, right? They needed to basically replace that number 
which is 1.2 million more than all of the houses in New York City, right? This huge number. So you can just try to imagine the kind of urgency of this task of rehousing that also needs to really address this issue of earthquakes and of fire. So Japanese engineers at the time are very, very aggressively going all over the world looking for different kinds of solutions to how to make new housing. Uh, they go to the Soviet Union. This is actually a uh, housing project being prefabricated, kind of plot and bow, uh, in, in Russia that's all made out of concrete panels where everything is structure. All the partition walls are structure, the exterior walls are structure, everything is load-bearing, extremely rigid. And the Japanese architects and engineers are thinking, mm, I don't think this is really, really the approach we want. And Meikawa, the architect of Harumi, has come back from working with Le Corbusier in Paris and he has this idea with him of this project here, uh, which is the idea of artificial land. And artificial land becomes an idea incredibly attractive in a country whose natural land, because of earthquakes and fire, has a lot of problems. And what is this idea of artificial land? It's really about building a building as a building site, to build a building as not a kind of finished product, but really as a series of platforms on which people can rent or buy a plot of land and build a house however they want, right? So it's really this kind of mixture of a top-down and bottom-up planning, where, as Corbusier envisioned, these kind of platforms would be built by the government, but then as a way of making new public uh, things, such as transportation systems, they would be renting or selling the platforms to, to raise public revenue. And I think this idea is really influenced uh, for Corbusier from the kind of industrial architecture we have in New York that was very much about a kind of flexibility and a durability. This is the Starrett Lehigh building on the west side. And this is actually a proposal, a uh, kind of joke, from Life magazine in 1909. This was actually proposed for Broadway right outside. So I think there's really this kind of <laughs> close uh, connection with this idea of artificial land with New York making its way to Paris through Corbusier make its way onto, onto Japan. So this is a little family tree here. Uh, you can see uh, the influence of um, Dr. Corbusier going to Meikawa, um, Kimura, the engineer, working with the architect, and then also Masato Otaka, one of the metabolist architects, working to make this building, the Arumi Apartments. So this building has a major problem, which is that it's built on landfill. This rectangular island right here, the one that's closer in towards central Tokyo, is actually man-made. It's a man-made island. It was made in the 20s. And Harumi was built on that. And the problem with that was that the soil was extremely soft. So you have this huge building. You have to understand that a 10-story concrete residential building had never, ever been built in Japan before. So this was an utterly new size and type of building. So you have this new building that is incredibly heavy. It has a very low budget. And it's being built on very soft sand soil. So what Kimura started to study was you know, how am I going to make this building be earthquake-proof, be fireproof, and work at 10 stories on this soft soil? And so he starts to do these investigations where he realizes that instead of having every floor be structure, if he makes only every fourth floor actually structure with these very fat beams, that he can have fewer welds in the building. And I know this is very detailed, but welding was extremely expensive at the time. Uh, welding was essential to making reinforced concrete frames to resist earthquakes. And so what they came up with is what Kimura refers to as a major structure. By having this very big grid, you could have much less welding, you'd have to drive fewer piers into the soil, and therefore, thereby you would arrive at this earthquake-proof structure that was also done on a shoestring. And so inside the major structure, is slipped basically this very lightweight structure, which Kimura called the minor structure, which has absolutely no load-bearing role besides supporting four small apartments. So there's total separation of structural roles here between the major structure and the minor structure. You can see that here in section with all the, the minor structure kind of slipped into the major structure, coming together and forming like Voltron. Uh, and when you see inside of the apartments, they're actually really, really small, right? And so Again, to come back to the urgency of rehousing, there was this push with the government's low budget to remake as many of these 4.2 million houses as quickly as possible. And so, you know, very traditional inside, which I think is quite, quite a beautiful kind of contrast with the exterior of the building, but at the same time, tiny. So this is a comparison here actually between uh, one of the 
uh, recent micro apartments that was part of the competition that the city had last year uh, for uh, the east side in Manhattan and actually one of Harumi's apartments. You can see Harumi's apartments are actually much smaller, considerably smaller, than the micro apartments that are currently being considered small by New York standards. And I think what's really critical about this that gets to my point about resiliency and Harumi as bouncing forward is that in Manhattan, there's been, in New York City at large really, there's been this realization that there's a mismatch between the kind of housing that gets built, the kind of apartments that get built, we only have studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, three bedrooms typically, and what actually different kinds of households in the city need, right? There's not this kind of allowance for more kinds of types of living together of things as simple as a micro apartment, it seems there's a basic idea, but it's kind of this discovery that all of a sudden we need tiny apartments. So what I think is really fascinating is that in Japan, totally the reverse happened. That by the 1970s, you had so many so-called micro apartments that people taking surveys actually all were rejecting these public housing projects because the apartments simply didn't allow them to have a family. So I think to Harumi's designer's credit, what is really amazing about this building is that it really was something able to not just bounce back in its kind of ability to resist earthquakes and fire, but was really able to bounce forward by this massive grid of the frame, allowing for the building to basically be kind of excavated and sculpted to make new larger apartments. So you can see here that simply by removing the demising walls, they are doubling the sizes of each one of the units, or kind of more radically, they can be starting to remove whole sections of minor structure to really make sky gardens and terraces and other kinds of amenities that were totally what the architects and engineer predicted, that Japan's quality of life would improve as the, the economy improved, and that gradually these apartments would become too small. And so I think what's really fascinating with this project is how much it really is embracing the challenge of resiliency, the challenge of an extremely low budget, and taking these things that seem so rigid and totally flipping them around to make something that actually is incredibly flexible. So this is actually a demonstration of the minor structure being removed in 1997. Here you have one of the original units, your sort of uh, micro version, if you will. And then it has its uh, demising wall with the next apartment removed, and you sort of have something maybe a little bit loft-like, shall we say, uh, to part of the totally non-structural floor removed to make a double height space duplex, to then remove three floors and have actually a triple height space to really make something that's quite grand with a kind of sky garden. And Yes, this is <laughs> admittedly very rough concrete work. It was a prototype when it was made. Um, but I think the kind of unfortunate thing with this project is that despite this kind of ambition to really adapt to uh, the changes in Japanese society, to kind of bounce forward to, to accommodate them, you have the bubble economy of Japan in the, in the 80s and its crash in the very early 90s leading actually to the, the demise of the building. So you can see uh, 1997 over here on the right, um, the prices of land have dropped dramatically from the height of the bubble, but still land prices have risen so much since the 1950s that this building is no longer economically viable. And on top of that, the zoning had changed in Japan. Uh, when Harumi was built, it was at 31 meters, which was the tallest you could build at the time. In 1963, the zoning was changed, and you could build anything as high as you wanted. So this is what has replaced Harumi today. Um, there's absolutely no memory in this building of this kind of incredible combination of spatial flexibility in the face of combating an earthquake that I think is really about trying to support different kinds of social changes. So I don't think all is a waste in this experiment. I think that you know, the ambition that Kimura and the architect Meikawa had for Hrumi is phenomenal. Um, but this idea of trying to make a transitional architecture, a kind of transitional typology, is one that really has found success in a second project uh, that Kimura worked on, the Hiroshima, uh, Muromachi, and Chojuan apartments. Um, it was 4,200 units that were built for mostly uh, survivors of the, the A-bomb. Um, in 1968, the first phase of it was completed. And 
This project was built using the same idea of the major structure, of having this kind of large frame in which you could flexibly insert different kinds of, of apartments. Um, in fact, there were only <laughs> initially two kinds of apartments that were exactly the same as the ones at Harumi that were also far too small. It was realized by the 19, late 1970s. And you can see here, actually, the project, the whole proposal, the idea of the kind of transitional, flexible frame adapting to society has really been working. And this is what's currently being done in the building over the past number of years. They're carefully moving through each one of the blocks to phase the enlargement of each one of the units, both to attract um, new demographic to the building, but also to enlarge the current units for the existing tenants. So you can see the original unit going from 36 meters squared onto 55, 53, 72, down below from 42 meters to 66 to 59. And I think that this kind of flexibility found really in the face of public architecture, not just public architecture, but, but public housing, I think is, is really an incredible achievement to try to bring to, I think, the way that we start to think about new housing built in the city here. Um, to really think of it in an infrastructural way that really is embracing flexibility, especially because I think this issue of lifestyle and of household has become so much to the fore in New York City. Uh, this is a final project that Kimura was an engineer on, coming back to this kind of idea of fatness, not the kind of fat frame, but here uh, for a co-housing project in Osaka. All of the floors are extremely fat, which has allowed the residents who all worked with an architect to design their own units custom to have kitchens and bathrooms located anywhere inside of the building. So very kind of banal in a way, but really a kind of design feature that in its kind of essential kind of focus on services is allowed for a kind of lifestyle of unfolding in the building that is totally unique, I think. Um, so I think there are these kind of failures in some of these experiments, for sure. I think there's a kind of, there is a kind of heaviness that maybe is not something we want to kind of recreate today. Uh, but I think what really is the amazing kind of achievement of Kimura in what he really suggests for today, I think especially for a place like New York, is really that it makes no sense, perhaps, I think, to have an architecture that is about engaging the changing climate that is also not, at the same time, able to engage changes of society. And really, I think the, the lesson of Harumi is that resilient design really needs to enable a diversity, and it can't simply be about simply recovery. Thank you.